Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I'm gonna kick this video off discussing both Granite Ridge and Strix Point. The former in particular does sound more like an Intel processor, but no, instead we're gonna be talking about AMD's upcoming roadmap. And there has been a lot of leaks actually for AMD's upcoming processors recently. We've really been delving into Zen 4, which, you know, is now finalized in its design and it's going to be released next year. But that does not mean that AMD's execution is slowing down at all. And there have been a couple of very interesting updates for AMD's Zen 5 based products, which we'll get into now. So first things first, I'd like to credit uh, ITSCG. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, to be honest with you, but uh, I'll link their um, messages on uh, sorry, in the video description. And they have provided a roadmap for Granite Ridge. You can see that basically everything here is uh, well just completely and utterly blanked out however it is for ryzen 8000 we'll get into that in just a second as well as strix point where it is showing that it's on n3 and you will also notice zen 5 as well as zen 4d and furthermore vegeta or broly underscore x1 states that strix point adopts the hybrid architecture of zen 5 and zen 4 and introduces a new cache the desktop version, we don't know whether this is going to be adopted, but it is certain that it's going to be on uh, the free NM process. So this is quite interesting because basically there has been a lot of discussion that with the kind of more mobile variants, so for example, laptops, we will see big and small cores, which of course is not quite the technical term. You know, we're looking at heterogeneous processors. And it seems that AMD are continuing to evolve from there. And I've been hearing quite a lot of stuff actually through the grapevine about Zen 5, but a lot of it is very wishy-washy at the moment. One thing I have been told pretty consistently though is Zen 5 is a very different design compared to that of um, let's say Zen 4. So what do I mean by a different design? Because you know, if you compare let's say Zen 1 to Zen 2 or Zen 2 to Zen 3, they're not the same obviously there are major differences in terms of the architecture right and that of course is what you would expect but i'm hearing that the design philosophy themselves have kind of changed and again i'll really want to know more details but from what i can gather zen 5 is really a, a a kick from AMD to push towards efficiency. So if you're, you know, kind of keeping up with what's happening with, let's say, Apple's M1 silicon, and of course, ARM and other such processes, you'll know that x86 is certainly not DOA. It's, it's doing okay, but there are a lot of inefficiencies in the architecture. And I'm hearing that Zen 5 is a push for AMD, uh, sorry, push by AMD to fix these inefficiencies. So, um, I do have more information, but I don't want to put it out there because quite frankly, I'm not 100% confident in it. I'm trying to get a little bit more. But getting back to the Strix point side of things, one theory I've been hearing from a couple of sources is that it could be the actual IO die that is Strix point rather than the um, processor itself. However, I am fairly confident that it is real. And of course, there's been a ton of leaks recently, for example, with AMD's push for 3D stacking, for example, with Milan X that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty damn certain, again, is real. And AMD are certainly pushing very hard in terms of the CPU space, but also APUs. And one of the benefits of AMD as a company is the fact that they can execute and create so many different products because they actually have so many different IPs. For example, you know, they can create an, uh, an APU which has, let's say, X number of Zen 5 cores, a couple of Zen 4, you know, small cores, little cores, whatever they end up, we can call them chipmunk cores for the rest of this video. And they can also, of course, incorporate RDNA IP as well. So that basically gives AMD a ton of flexibility going forward. I personally feel that Zen 4 is going to be a pretty big iteration. Like it's been pretty commonly reported at this point that Zen 4 is gonna have like a 20-ish percent IPC gain. Frankly, I think it's going to be more. Um, and yeah, I think the next couple of years, Intel are really gonna have their work cut out. I don't think that it's gonna be a case where Intel cannot compete, but I think it's going to be very difficult for them to compete. And I think the irony is that it could actually be easier for Intel to compete in the desktop 
than servers. However, as always, you know, the thing about roadmaps is that you might only know a portion of, you know, what the products actually are from any of these companies. And I feel that, you know, AMD have basically now confirmed that CDNA is actually going to be launching this year. Again, I leaked this uh, several months ago that CDNA 2 is going to be launching this year. And it does seem to be a chiplet-based design from what I can ascertain at this point. So AMD is certainly firing on all cylinders. I'm really excited actually to see what happens from AMD over the next uh, couple of years, especially with all of the news that we're hearing about like let's say um you know the next generation game engines and all of this type of thing i think that uh, the future whether you're a gamer whether you're you know interested in more high high performance computing i think you know you're certainly going to be well served and uh, it's it's kind of interesting because we had we had that kind of lull in tech and now it's just like everything's just going crazy again and of course one of the reasons behind this is e3 and this is a great segue because now we're going to be discussing some e3 things so Nintendo Switch is obviously a very successful and uh, very well received console by Nintendo. And I think Nintendo made a really great decision with their design philosophy around the Switch, i.e. creating a device which is certainly for everyone. You know, if you're a PlayStation gamer, an Xbox gamer, a PC gamer, you can make a really good argument that a Switch is a great compa uh, companion console. And whenever I fly, you know, take planes or like long journeys, to be honest with you, the Switch has certainly helped me a lot. Like I was playing uh, Mario Kart when I was flying to San Francisco or whatever. <laughs> it saved me, you know, like the the boredom and just wanting to throw myself out of the out of the uh, plane door. But there's been, of course, a lot of concerns that the Switch um, is starting to look a little bit long in the tooth, especially if you have a, a high definition uh, TV like 4K, especially. And of course, this is why we're hearing so many rumors now about. Uh, the Switch Pro or Super Switch, the name is not confirmed. But now Bloomberg as well as Eurogamer are reporting that there's a good possibility that we're going to see this system announced at E3. Now whether it's actually released at E3 or whether it's going to be later this year, which I personally think is more likely, I don't know. But yeah, I mean I've already leaked a ton of details about the Switch uh, Pro previously, um, which was a couple of exclusives, but I do believe it's based of course on uh, still a uh, NVIDIA um, SOC. And to my understanding, it definitely does use DLSS for upsampling. To my understanding, Nintendo as well as uh, NVIDIA have collaborated quite a bit on the upsampling tech. And I don't know whether it's exactly identical to that of how it works on the PC. Um, to my understanding, there's a good chance that we could have some level of tensor cores in the Switch uh, Pro, but I don't think it's got RT capabilities. The reports are that it has an OLED screen, which again, you know, I've mentioned a couple of times. And I, I personally think that it's going to be a very popular system. It's going to be interesting to see how it performs, um, let's say, in docked mode versus handheld. Obviously, the benefit of a handheld device is that you don't need, you know, so much performance. You could, uh, presumably, you could run at something more modest, like, for example, 720p to upsample to 1080p or... 540p even depending on what the quality is and of course they could also de uh, vary depending on the game itself as well because obviously you can set different internal resolutions depending on the title and the final piece of news for today is that sony are apparently going to be putting out a new revision of the playstation 5 now there's not exactly a ton of technical details as to what this revision is but we have a couple of sources of evidence. The first is a Twitter user, uh, their name is Atakama uh, just underscore now so I'll link their uh, Twitter account in the video description and this PlayStation 5 model is CFI-1015A. Furthermore there's mention of a wireless module as well which is Sony Group Corporation um, and it is a M20 DAL1. Again, I will uh, link the Twitter account which discovered this in the video description. I don't have a ton of stuff to say about this, to be honest with you. Uh, the PlayStation 5 obviously is going to go through iterations as the console ages. Um, but we do know that Sony are most likely going to want to release a revision to cheapen the production cost of the system. I've already mentioned that Sony are losing quite a bit of money per system created. Now, they can make this up, of course, 
quite easily through different methods like you buying games for example peripherals blah 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 but the actual console itself does cost sony more money to produce and sell to you than what you are providing them in return i.e they are selling the system at a loss and the digital edition is actually costing them even more just simply because of the fact that they're not really saving too much with the uh, removal of the you know blu-ray drive they're losing you know a couple of bucks worth of components slightly cheaper machining on the case and uh, i guess the blu-ray license as well is you know whatever amount that is it's probably like 10 ish dollars or something like that per per system sold again it's not a huge amount so um, i heard that the physical base system is losing them around a hundred dollars per console sold and obviously the the uh, digital edition is more so it's probably more like 160 170 dollars either way it doesn't matter sony will continue to iterate on their system the question is is this a slimline system or is it not and it's just a small update to the internal revisions and honestly i don't know um, i still believe that there will be a slimline system released again i've mentioned that it's possibly utilizing 5nm however there was also that report that sony are going to be releasing a version on 6nm now do remember that 6nm even according to tsmc you can do a google of this um basically uh tsmc does believe that their customers will switch from 7 to 6 nm and most of the actual you know it, the design of 7 and 6 nm is essentially the same the only real difference is it's um, 6 nm is you uh, made using uh eev so basically it's 6 nm in name but really you can think of it as more like 7 plus i guess it's a whole thing but it, it again the, the the major point here is that uh, we don't know whether it's such a big revision that there's changes to the actual sock itself or whether it's just small iterative you know tweaks to the system for example maybe they've improved the cooling of memory or you know maybe they've removed like two screws or whatever and of course if they're going to be changing anything they have to refile all of that and obviously you know kind of prove that the system isn't going to explode in people's faces this is why we're starting to see all of this stuff surface i'll be interested to see if it launches this year because obviously if sony can reduce the cost of the system for them to produce even if it's like 20 30 dollars again if you're selling millions of consoles that can quickly start to mount up but I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. You know what to do if you did. Leave a thumbs up and of course uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.